host, welcome to Tea Time, a show that spotlights the growing and changing world of vintage, and not only the clothes themselves, but the stories and people behind them. Covering everything from reselling to sustainability, this is the ThriftCon Podcast. Oh yeah, in the Let me studio. Back up a little bit. Get my big fat head out of the way. <laughs> How you doing, Brian? Are you feeling better? Yeah, I don't know what I just run down. I was um, I was working super late and then um, got up super early to bring my my son to school, and then it just kind of caught up with me, and I was wiped out. Yeah, life. Nothing. Yeah, nothing major. Thank God. Good. No good. How are you guys? Out. We're good, man. We're good. We're here. We're here. We're, we're full swing. We got a little event coming up in LA in a few weeks, so we're just getting ready for that, and then making stuff in the in the in the meantime. Nice. Yes, sir. Amazing. So let's just get started. So we have uh, artist Brian Fox here on the line with us. Uh, we're interviewing him about Liquid Blue today. Uh, let's just start off by you giving us a little background on yourself personally. Who are you? Just intro yourself. Um, okay. Uh, thanks for having me. First of all, oh, this, of is, course, this is dude. great. We're You're our first yeah. guest ever on our podcast, by the way. Oh, so talk, we're, talk we're, about we're, le- we're learning. <laughs> right. Yeah. We're going to bring you all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, well, um, I don't know. I mean, I was always into art, into, uh, drawing and painting and, um, always working in the commercial field as well. And then that's kind of what led me into liquid blue, probably in two. No, 1997, maybe 96, 97. I started working for those guys. So it was kind of went from one commercial field job to another and it ended ended up uh, being there. And then after leaving there in 2004, I went on my own, um, didn't go into the, the apparel industry, which I thought I was going to, but didn't. And then materialized materialized into doing sports art and celebrities and and, the, and Hollywood and stuff like that. But that was uh, over the, since 2004, and you know that's almost 15, 16 years ago. So that's what I've been doing solely now to provide for the family. Amazing, amazing. So before Brian reached out to you. Yeah. Uh, did you have any idea that people were were selling these liquid blue t-shirts, especially selling ones with your art on them, that they were in the resale market? Only recently. Well, I, I yes, but but no, really no clues. I mean, some people reached out on Instagram saying, hey, uh, we collect liquid blue shirts. And I was like, you do? And, <laughs> and it was like used ones. And I'm like, used t-shirts? You're, you're collecting used t-shirts? Oh, yeah, these are vintage. I'm like, vintage? Man, I feel old. Um, so that was when I had an inkling about it, but only when I started talking to Brian that I was like, you're kidding me. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> I haven't been in that apparel world for gosh, since 2004. So I had no clue. And it's scary when people start throwing the word vintage at you when you're still oh my alive. God. Right. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's, it's so weird. And, and again, you start listening to the oldie station and Guns N' Roses is on there. And you're like, oh, that's just, that's over. Yeah, you know what no, I mean? No, no person wants to be a vintage person. No. Uh, so what was, what was your like artist background before you even hit Liquid Blue? Was it, were you just doodling on things at, at high school or did you have a, a certain program and, you went through? And what age was it that you started at Liquid Blue? Oh, okay. Um, let me answer the age question first, because I was trying to think about it this morning to and, and I, I probably late 20s, early 30s. Okay. So I, I can't remember exactly what, what the date was, but, but around that time. And um, yeah, I would say that that was probably a late 20s, early 30s. And then uh, but back to your other question was, do I was I, like every artist seems to always be drawing, always be doodling on the on, on your you know notebooks or during school and. Um, and, and fortunately, I was always encouraged to kind of go that path. I wasn't good at anything else. So my parents always kind of encouraged me, yeah, keep going the art path. And nobody in my family ever went to college. So they were like, you're going to go to college and you're going to go for art. And I went for I, illustration. So that kind of gives you like where, I, I started go going out. And do, well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Where did you go to school? UMass Dartmouth. And it was for illustration. I wanted to do fantasy magazine covers and things like that. Dungeons and Dragons, all that shit. And it was kind of cool and started doing it and then got into the, you know, the freelance stuff. And I was like, ah, I hate doing freelance stuff. And then I worked for some companies 
And then when you work for the companies, like I work for a magazine, an on-staff illustrator, you learn to get up at a certain time, you learn to punch a clock, you learn to kind of, you know, you don't, you don't wait for inspiration, you kind of have to produce. So it was kind of really a good training ground for, for that. And then from there, I went to work for a newspaper, which was total hell, um, designing ads. I was out of a job. At that time, I was living in a shed trading my drawings for food. And, and a buddy of mine that I played old man softball with says, hey, we're hiring at the, the, the newspaper. You want to come here? I'm like, no, but I need a job. And then I went and worked in the design department for a year, which was torture. And um, then from there, I went to Liquid Blue. Could you describe for some of our listeners what a newspaper is? <laughs> what is that? Uh, you know, it's, it's scary, but that's this part truth. In that. People paid for ads in those things? <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's a, here i am ready yeah. for a serious question i'm going oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> no i love that though so it, honestly that is really a good story we've seen that we see that time and again with other people that we've covered on this podcast you know nothing's uh nothing's overnight right especially if you are oh. going the this this the artist route the kind of do it your own way DIY route, like it is, you know, it, it, it takes some work and it, you might have to eat shit for a little bit, but, but I, so I do love, I love hearing that story because, because look yeah. where you've come, right? Yeah. It's, and I wasn't planning on it going in this direction. I mean, I like sports, I like playing sports recreationally and um, I like painting. So I kind of merged the two. And at the time my wife was working, this was just after I left liquid blue at, and I'm, I know I'm jumping a little forward, but I had left liquid blue and thought I was going to do apparel and stuff like that. Never really worked out. And, you know, I'm trying to get things going, but nobody knows me at the time. And, and, and luckily for the Boston area, everybody's fans are ravenous up here. So the Red Sox win in 04, the first time in 86 years, mm -hmm. I get swept up in it because I paint Kurt Schilling in the bloody sock beating the Yankees. And we auctioned it off for his ALS charity. And I got swept up in, in that media. Because anything Red Sox related at that time, people were just wanting any kind of story. So here's an artist that donates a painting and it's to the Red Sox after 86 years, big story. So, but it took probably five to six years before I made it any money to, to really bring into the household. Yeah. I was Mr. Mom, I was taking care of, my wife was pregnant and, and uh, we had one young son, on the, uh, young son and one on the way and a mortgage and a car payment. And, it's kind of scary times to kind of go, holy shit, you know? And then in 2008, you know, everything tanked, you know, so it was kind of a crazy time. And people were not buying art when they're. Yeah. It's a luxury places. item. Yeah. Nobody needs what I do. It's like, we need a carpenter, a, an electrician, a plumber. We don't need me. Yeah. So to find those people that were um, willing to pay for stuff, I, I ended up going through the sports industry. So, Kurt Schilling, there was no bigger athlete on the planet at that point. And then Tom Brady was on the rise. So one kind of led to another. And then when you get linked in with these teams that are on the rise themselves, I was kind of fortunate to ride that wave with them. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, like, like you said, going back a little bit, I guess back to the liquid blue days before we got sure. there. Um, can you give us an idea of what, what a typical work day would have looked like for you at liquid blue <laughs> in those in those first couple of years <laughs> it, it, listen when i first got that job aside from really not knowing how to work on the computer um it was a great job because it was a big plant they kind of did everything in-house so what i mean by that is they had their own sales team they had their own art department they had their own printing department they had their own dye department everything was in one one big building and all the departments were there in the art room was kind of off by itself and once i got comfortable and knew everybody there it was probably let's see one two three, maybe seven or eight guys total one or two were designers and web guys but the rest were artists and we were kind of free to come up with whatever we want and we'd get together with the owner who was the art director and he would kind of go through the stuff and say all right we, i like this one develop this one further things like that that's kind of how the process worked and you kind of worked in a cubicle but in a room full of artists. Was the owner still Paul at this point? It's still Paul. How do you it, say it, you know, his last funny. name? Because we don't know. R Roy Doolis. Roy Doolis. We didn't know Roy Doolis Dulis. Dulis. or Roy yeah. Dooley. He, he, he texted me last night, believe it or not. He said he's a very charismatic guy. 
And um, so we'd get this, we'd come in and, and I'd get there early because I traveled. It took me about 45 minutes to get to work and I have to go through Providence, Rhode Island, which was always a pain in the ass. So I would come in early and this other artist would come in early too. His name was John and uh, John Connell. And he, he's done, he had been there for a long time and was really the golden goose of, of that company. And, um, but he and I hit it off very well. We became best friends. And it would be at one point I'd get there so early, I would hide, whether it be under a desk or, or in the dark room or somewhere. And he would come in half asleep because he'd get there early. And I would jump out at him like Cato in the Pink Panther. And we'd start wrestling in the morning, like to the point where we'd be rolling around on the rug, just wrestling with each other and just trying to choke each other out. We'd get all these rug burns and, and stuff. And, and we'd go to lunch later in the day. And, and that's a whole different, lunch was great. But, and I'll have to tell you about that. But we'd be in line with the owner and the owner would look at us and go, what the hell happened to you two? And, and we'd be like, uh, we were, we were kind of fighting and wrestling this morning. He's like, oh, you can't be doing that, right? I mean, we got all this equipment there, we're rolling around. So, I mean, it was a great kind of atmosphere where you had these super creative people in there and you also had, you know, um, they were fun to hang out with too. So, I mean, it, and then lunch, you, you get on this lunch plan. And I'm not saying like you got this little peanut butter and jelly sandwich. When I got there, they had the chef, you bought into the lunch plan and it had to be 20 bucks a week. I mean, something ridiculously low, 20, 25 bucks a week. And you got meals. I mean, you got like chicken palm. You got, it changed every day. Plus you've got a salad. Plus, I'm like, holy shit, this is amazing. So, you know, for me, it was trading my drawings for food not long ago. I'm going, oh, hey, I hit a lottery. So yeah, it was kind of cool. It was a cool, it was a cool job. And you kind of were able to come up with all these different designs. And, and, and you were told what to do with certain things. but. Um, that's kind of a typical day. You know, other artists came in at 10 o'clock in the morning and they would leave later in the day. And, you know, I'd be out of there by 3.30 and same thing with that other guy, John, he'd be out of there by 3.30, so. So one question I had, just because, you know, in us doing this, we've, we've done a lot of podcasts. We co covered brands like Patagonia and Levi's and Nike, Adidas. Wow. Um, and it's really easy to, it's really easy to find information about those brands online, right? There's, there's tons of it. There's, there's been books written about them. There's lots of shit out there. But when you Google the history of liquid blue, you find a couple sentences, okay? Like there's like, the, really? It like there's really nothing. There's not a lot of information living out there. Even on the liquid blue website, their about us page is like two sentences long. Um, <laughs> and, and the website looks like it, it, it was, they haven't updated it since the, the web designers that you were there with made it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, so how I got the job in the first place is this goes back like my father plays in a rock band, still plays in a rock band. And he he ended up somehow crossing paths with Paul, the owner. And he's like, hey, my, my son's an artist. And, and Paul, of course, is like, oh, yeah, yeah, everybody tells me that. And he says, well, have him interview or have him uh, send his portfolio. And this was when they were in Attleboro, Mass. I went to work for him at Link in Lincoln, Rhode Island. But um so I had submitted my portfolio and he kind of said, hey, come on in for an interview. I came in, I think I came in for an interview, but never took the job. I think it was twice I had come in for an interview. I was like, ah, this is too far. I don't feel like driving. I just was like, fuck it. I, you know, I'm going to go play ball. I'm going to go do my thing and never took the job. And then the third time I did take the job and that was in Lincoln, Rhode Island. He had already moved his company, had already grown. I think he was in a warehouse or something in Attleboro. But what my dad had told me was essentially Paul was a deadhead when he was younger. He still is, I'm sure. But yeah. what he would do is he would make these stickers at his dad's print shop and he would travel around and sell these stickers on tour with the dead. And the dead, he would do it so much and make so much money that the dead finally found out and said, like, hey, you either license or we're taking you to court. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I either we're so doing he this with you or you're not doing this shit. <laughs> yeah, and he licensed and he had done super well with, with Grateful Dead t-shirts. So that was his first claim to fame on these tie-dyes. And, and he's got a great eye and he's a great art director. And so he kind of knew what he was doing and um, knew what was good, knew what would sell. And he used his business savvy to kind of grow it. But by the time I came in, they were already well-established. And then they started branching out. They had already started branching out into fantasy and then doing all the animal stuff and, the, and, and on all that nature and, and everything like that. So by the time I got there, they were already moving very quickly. And I think Jerry Garcia had passed away already. But um, so I kind of came in right in the middle of it all. What were some of the licensing deals or, or uh, 
brands, entities that you guys were working with while you were there? Who, who, who were your, like either bands, NFL, NBA, MLB, any of those? Who who was on board while you were there? And That's was there the any only cool one IP when I first... you got to any cool IP that you got to design with? Yeah, the, the, well, wh- when I got there, it was only Grateful Dead. And I think Fish might have been getting involved with, they were getting involved with Fish. But prior to that, it was really just the Grateful Dead. When I was there for this, I was there for seven years. So during those seven years, and I, the, they got the NFL license. They got, they worked with Disney quite a bit. I remember doing stuff for Siegfried and Roy and a lot of the casinos out in Vegas. I remember doing um, some stuff with the Muppets and, and Jim Henson Productions. All this was going on. And sometimes things, you just did samples and other times things came through. And then I worked with the NHL. So it was kind of cool to do those projects as well. Although those were, you had to stick to a style guide. You had to use certain PMS colors. It was a, a little bit more restricting for an artist. Yeah. Um, and if you did it for one team, let's say the NHL, you had to do it for all teams. So if it was 32 teams in the, you had to kind of carbon copy those. So although it was a great moneymaker for the company, after a while as an artist, you're like, Ugh. Yeah, you, you know, kind of get burnt out on yeah. doing that same thing. Yeah, and then you always worked on like 10 different projects at the same time, if not more. What yeah. were the ones that you did for the NHL? You did, you did the Puckhead, I believe, right? I did do the, I did do the Puckhead. I used, my, I used my big fat head. I was like, I stuck a puck in my mouth and I took some photos and then we kind of changed it around. Is that, is that you on I, the Puckhead? The, is that your face? That <laughs> is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's funny. Oh, We'd all pose so for good. each other too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We would always pose for each other, and and, and you know, you didn't have Google images. Yeah, you didn't have Google images. You had to use. What no, there was yeah. none of that. <laughs> it was not, and even digital cameras were just starting to come into play. Where we're like, oh my god, this is awesome. So, yes. uh, you tried to figure out some way of doing it all. Wow, awesome. What was what was some of the first ones that you did uh, that actually really took off? Uh, well, you. I, trying to think i did some dragon shirts i did i brought some stuff that i found in a box over here like i i was like i had all these samples after i got off the phone with brian i was like i think i gave half my shit away i think i think i might have used them for rags brand new shirts well back in the 90s they were brand new shirts i still got them um but i'm trying to but think they, what they ended up cleaning your car <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and, and then I'm getting these calls going, hey, you know what shows are worth? I'm going, ah, and then I'm like, oh, fuck, shit. So, you know, was one, of one of the first questions I had is like, is he, does he got some? Does he got a box? I do. Or what? <laughs> Hang on. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, I got, like, all these different shirts, like, I, I brought, like, I found, I these are just think. some, I know I have a bunch more, but these are like, these have never been worn, but they're from, you know, early 2000s. So, and again, one thing when I was talking to Brian, he was saying how, you guys know the stitching on the shirts or the garment. I'm right. going, what? so <laughs> these are those shirts. And, and I kind of, you know, I did a whole series of, you know, fantasy stuff and nature stuff and uh, American Indian. And, you know, you got the, you know, the Grim Reaper and you got the, right. you know, the, Ooh, that one. And there's all sorts good. of stuff. Yeah. And then you just kind of play around and, you know, you just kind of come up with the all over shirts. And, and you so know, that's, uh, that's, that's the, the ones, biggest part. So the, the, the thing is, you know, all over prints those large screen prints that is just something that right now for whatever reason when it broke in like you know later 2000s right now no, people aren't doing like if you go to get uh some t-shirts made from a screen printing company you know you have your your area is only 13 by 15 or something like like that no one wants to do the all over large size prints uh and so it's very it's that's one of the reasons these uh, liquid blue tees have come becomes so collectible, right? It's the when, when the when the print spans like across onto the collar and the sleeves, like that's just something that people aren't doing as much. Very, very, very few, far and few between these days. And so, yeah, love to see those. Love to see that you pull those out. Those are amazing. Yeah, I appreciate it. And and they were no. And I think so. Another, I think, moment for those guys. And again, it was before I got there. It was they called this artist? His name was Prof. And it was the first all over shirt they ever did. It was a dragon shirt. It was this big red and yellow dragon that went all over. And, and they had done so well. And this had to be in the early 90s that it had done so well that they were just printing day and night this shirt. And again, it was an all over press. And I watched them print these things. And it's a, it's a process. 
Oh, I'm sure. And it was so one of our friends, actually, uh, our good friends that started ThriftCon with us, he uh, he owns a company called Backstock now that does kind of this the new age bootlegs, if you will, like kind of like the new age lot tees. And he's doing them of old artists and stuff, kind of making merch for artists who didn't have merch or lot style stuff. And, and yeah, he does the all over prints and it is a process. We know from first hand. Yeah. I mean, he, you got to you got to hit th- certain things in different areas, all the different colors laying down. It's it's not easy. It's not easy. No, and, and, and again, you're talking an expense too. So it's, uh, although it's, it's hard, it was hard to do and it took longer to get the shirts in and out. So you, time is money for these guys. And then you're talking a press that has the, the extra part mm-hmm. for the sleeve. Yep. And then you have, to, you have to put them through the dryer and bigger and wider. So it, it, was, a, it was a process from start to finish. No doubt. So a lot of these designs that you were doing, they, they definitely hit like a certain sort of subculture, if you will. Um, were, there, were there kind of like limits to what you could do, how far you could push the limit in that subculture of you, you kind of know what we're talking about, whether it's like, like smoking weed or, you know, dropping acid or something. Um, were, there, were there certain limits, like how far could you push that line to being overtly in that world versus being something that could sell on the rack? We, uh, you know, that's a great question. We never really addressed it openly. We just kind of drew our stuff and, and then it was like, yeah, that works. Yeah, this, this doesn't, or that doesn't, or that would sell. And this, you know, we just looked at, you know, what would sell. We, we wouldn't get the actual numbers of the, you know, the sales, the actual money, but we would look at the numbers of the shirts. Like we'd get these printouts going, hey, look, this shirt is selling 10,000 a month, or this is selling 5,000 a month, or this is selling 50. So you started to look at it on, on a business level of going, hey, this is what's selling. This is the way uh, you want to lean towards. And then we just, again, come up with more designs. Hey, and if that design hit, we would, you know, kind of expand on that. Yeah, well, kind of double down on that, on that vibe. Yep. What was and the, we, had an arc, uh... we had an art director and then the owner. So the, the art director was here, and then the owner was above him. So we kind of you know, work with those guys and those guys kind of just, Hey, look, move in this direction. And, you yeah, know, that's what I was going to gonna ask kind of the hierarchy or what was the process of, of approval after, you know, or I guess what was the percentage of like, how many, were you making a bunch of designs that never saw the light of day? Like did all you, the time. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I still have after, again, I got off the phone with Brian and I have this massive folder that when I had left, I thought I was going to do more shirts and stuff like that. But you know, we had a certain process that we used to work on. We'd start sketching them all out on paper first. That's the way I was working. I wasn't used to the computer. So I'd sketch things out on paper, scan it in, kind of work it that way. But a lot of times you'd sketch it out on paper on like a mock t-shirt, right? And then you'd show the, Paul, we'd show, we'd re, ultimately everything always came down to, to, you had to talk to Paul. He was the guy that approved everything or not. You had an art director who would help you a little bit, but essentially Paul was the guy. So you'd go in there with these sketches with Paul and sometimes it was with all the artists, but many times you just go into the office with him and go, hey, I got a stack of drawings. Here's the latest stuff I'm working on. Which one do you think is strongest? Which one should I develop? Which one should I flesh out? And then from there, you kind of would go on. But he could give you 10, you could go in there with 10, 20 ideas and he could go, all right, work on these 10. You know, plus you have things to do for the NFL. Plus you had things to do for whoever you were working with as well. So, which also went through Paul. You had to show him all these designs and, so it was constantly, we had a lot of work to do. Yeah. So, and so, you know, like it. it does, it does. So, so, you know, we had a, this was a question I feel like you kind of answered, but so it, Paul was, he was the driving force about where you were going to, what you were going to go, what's what you were going to put out, what spaces you were going to go into. And then just kind of looking at the sales afterward helped determine what you doubled down on. For sure. There was a, I think I was talking to Brian about this when we were on the call and again, this was just before I came in where one of the artists had said, hey, look, and, and this is back when Star Wars was re-released for the first time. They hadn't even talked about making the next, everything that's going on. They were like, they just re-released all the old movies, Return of the Jedi, Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back in the theaters for the first time. But one of the artists was so big into Star Wars, he talked Paul into going, hey, look, let's take, let's make some artwork and put it on tie dyes. And, and let's put it out there. And it was a grand slam for that company where, I mean, they were just printing money because it was, it just produced that many. I mean, you have a, a fan base that ravenous and that big and you give them a new product to collect. And there was nothing on the market at that time. Right. So again, he hit another grand slam with that. One. So 
you would get these different, you could throw ideas at Paul and he could, he would look at it and assess it and go, yeah, let's try that. Or, or let's, you know, and then you try to get the, you, you would go back to the, um, the dye department and go, Hey, this is the idea I have for a t-shirt. Can you make this for us? So the artists had a lot of kind of creative leeway that way too. That's very cool. It's like a, it's, a, it's an awesome mix of just allowing the artists to be creative and make what they want, design what they want, and then kind of just tying it into things that already have large fan bases, like the licensed products, and then what's going on, like striking while the iron's hot, like you said, like hitting Star Wars tees right when the Star Wars craze hits. Like, that's, it's awesome. Um, I guess I have a question. Um, sure. When, at what point, or was there a certain point when you were just making designs, they were getting printed and sold versus the the t-shirts that actually got a hit with your name on it what 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 led to your name actually be being on the shirt versus some of them without your name on it or were they you always know, on there and we're just we just would forget to do it oh because <laughs> we were asking we were like there's some some of the most popular ones like don't have the artist's name on it yeah. we were just wondering and, and and most likely that's probably that guy john because he could give two shits about it and 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 you know he's like yeah whatever 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 and and I was just so used to signing my name to my drawings and paintings. I was like, eh, put my name on there. And it was just kind of cool to go, Hey, my name's on a t-shirt. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? To go yeah. home and show your girlfriend or your wife at the time. You know what I mean? You go, Hey, look at that. And then after a while you're like, eh, whatever. I suppose yeah. it's different. You're not making a cut. You're, you're just making your, your salary or whatever. You're not making a cut. Yeah, so yeah. it doesn't matter. You just kind of want to get it, get it done and get on to the next project. And you don't think some yeah. fucking schmuck ass kids are going to 25 years start <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fucking selling your shit and collecting it. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, the dirtier, Which the is better. true. Yeah, we, again, we, we had a, we, we made a salary. We got, we got lunch every day. We got, it was, there was insurance. And for an artist, you're like, fuck, and that's the, that's the, you're hitting Powerball. So, and, and then we, we would sit there and we'd listen to books on tape all day, you know, put headphones on. So somebody's telling you a story while you're drawing. You're like, oh, my God, talk about being pampered. So, you know, <laughs> it, 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 I'm telling you, and, and we, you know, it was all. And then we listen to Howard Stern. Usually every morning we would just bust balls and kind of because we're all sitting in a line. Um, but it was a lot of fun, too. I mean, you know, I, I, we would prank each other all the time and constantly. And it was a lot of fun. Was there any kind of like fringe benefits outside of work that you got? Did some of, you know, the NHL, like, what? like did, they, did they invite you to parties for the NHL things or, uh, you know, some of these musicians would probably have shows coming through. Would you guys be able to sit in on those? The, uh, I think, I, I know Paul definitely was able to go to those things. He was the owner. He would be the okay. face of the company as well. So he would go out and he kind of knew a lot of these guys. So that did happen. It didn't trickle down to us too often. Um, I remember going to some trade shows or, or going to some of the, you know, when, when we got the NFL license, Liquid Blue ended up having a luxury suite in the, um, at, the at the Patriots Stadium. So we got to go to a couple of games like that, but uh, it didn't trickle down too much to the artists. It was mostly the, you know, the ownership and which rightfully so. I mean, yeah. you know, it's usually how it works. It still works like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So as an artist working now uh, in a completely different realm, obviously, than uh, pop culture yep. t-shirt design, how, how do you think your time at Liquid Blue helped shape your career or lead you down the path that you're, you're currently on? Tremendous. Because, and I've often thought about it, because now, what I do now is such a, it's, it's so bizarre, the job that I have. It's, it's because I never know who's going to call or what I'm going to do. And for example, I have to kind of, juggle anybody who calls and wants a painting or anybody who calls and wants a design for something. So you have to kind of have a business mind to it. So yeah. And I'm very unorganized. I write everything on my hand and uh, it's awful. So it stresses me out, but going to liquid blue, it, it taught you one again, show up on time, uh, produce, even though you don't feel like producing, you know, you'll hear a lot of artists. Well, I'm not in the mood. Well, tough shit. You know what I mean? It's like, you want to make a living at it. You got to produce. Uh, and then you really learned how to take criticism because Paul would come in and he would change a lot of things in your design. Hey, move this here, move this here, shrink this 10% or, or whatever it was. So either you got a thick skin or you didn't last too long. But now looking back that I can deal with anything with somebody going, Hey, can you change this? Sure. No problem. You know what I mean? Or you, you learn people skills or you learn skills and, and, and take an art direction from different people and, uh, and, and, and now 
I, every time I work for somebody, it's, it's like working for a new boss because it's, it's a client, it's a customer. And then you work in, like, I'll work with Steven Tyler from Aerosmith or directly, and he'll give me his ideas or Mark Wahlberg or, you know, uh, Tom Brady or Rob Gronkowski, all these guys want different paintings and drawings and different projects. And, and I, now I work with Walt Disney too. So it's kind of like, they kind of liquid blue in that environment set me up for how to deal with those sort of art direction or the, the totally things from left field. Because it's more business minded at that point for somebody like Walt Disney. Oh, oh it's all business for those guys. And you start to realize um, you better, and that, that's like, a, that's like the military down there where they, where they got so many steps you got to go through and layers of people. And, and then you have to appease all those layers of people too. So as an artist, you're like, shit, I got it. But if you want to survive, you want to do it on your own. You kind of have to really change your thinking and go, I got to be a good business person as well. So liquid blue kind of trained you for that. And I didn't know that until I was really out of there for a few years. I looking back, you're like, wow, it was really, uh, it was benefit to me to do that. I guess that's what anybody really wants out of that, that kind of first job or, you know, it wasn't your first job, but it was the one that kind of got you in the league to do what you're doing now. So that's what everybody's looking for when they say they want experience, when they say they want that job. But uh, I feel like people, a lot of people, we personally know a lot of people in the world should be taking notes right now. Oh, really? It's, it's, listen, it, I go in and speak to colleges and schools and different things like that. And I try to tell people like, look, you got to think marketing, you have to think, and most artists are very shy. They don't want to show their stuff. And that goes against you in the long run. If you're outgoing enough to, to chat with people or network is really, especially now, if I don't get out there and go to the, the games and go to these uh, events and different things that I, I now am able to go to, I don't, the work will eventually dry up. So you have to kind of get out there and be able to chat with people and be able to talk to people and show them your work because they, if they don't know you exist, you're going to start. Yeah. I mean, the, the the dream of being this artist who sells canvases one off canvases for millions of dollars like you know i can probably count the amount of living artists on my hands that do that like the damian hursts of the world yep. um you, if you even if your art does climb to that that level it's typically when you're dead right so you got to <laughs> figure out how to do something while you're alive <laughs> it's true yeah you gotta it's, make it it's, while it's you're definitely alive. true um, speak yeah, a little it, bit it, more. Oh, okay. so, sorry, what we were going to say. No, no, go ahead. Off. I was just going to go say, ahead. speak a little bit more because I loved the stories we were getting into in the first part before we hopped into Liquid Blue. Just sure. about that, your career, your life after Liquid Blue. Kind of what, what led into these, to working with the, the likes of Steven Tyler and Mark Wahlberg and Tom Brady. Kind of how did you get there from doing t-shirts to doing that? Well, um, like I said, the, the Red Sox, and I'm, yeah. I think it was being in the right region. Yep. Uh, I love sports. And then I didn't have any money. So, I mean, my wife was working and I was Mr. Mom. So at night I would try to do these, try to get a career. I, mean, I would try everything. I would try, you know, designing toys. I would try designing animation series and try to get an agent and sell those things. At the meantime, selling paintings for, I think I was selling paintings of, of, of like Patriot players, just the friends of mine for 400 bucks. I mean, big, big paintings, for 400 bucks. And I, I think I was excited to sell it for 400 bucks. Um, and now that they, they sell for probably 20,000. So it, it's, it's kind of when you start off like that, it's definitely uh, humbling and you're trying to scrape in any money at all. And I don't know which which is gonna break first. Like, hey, is it gonna be an animation that I am trying to develop and sell? Or is it going to be paintings? I'm just throwing as much shit against the wall and seeing what sticks. So I'm nonstop trying to do it, nonstop trying to come up with an idea and bring money into the house. Um, so that's kind of how it really started off. And then, it, like I said, when I started working with the, uh, the, the Red Sox and then the Patriots, it was really on the charity side of things. I would say, hey, look, I can help your charity out. If I did a painting, you signed it, we could auction it off. And that's another whole entity that started to take off so when the players started making let's say i think it was matt light had me do a and he played for the patriots uh had me do a painting of tom brady and west welker and they both those guys he knew them of course he played with plays with them he had them sign it and i think they raised sixty thousand dollars with this painting so of course 
When you're making somebody else that kind of money, they go, hey, let's do it again. But I would in turn make sure the newspapers heard about all these stories. So I would get marketing value out of it for free because I'm calling up the newspapers, talking, saying, hey, look, I'm just I'm working with the, the top athletes right now. I got a cool story for you. So they would come down and film me in the house. And I started doing stuff with the Patriot, uh, the Red Sox, and they were winning. They won another World Series in 07. So it started to kind of catch um, fire a little bit. At, at each time I did something more, I would get in the news or I would be on TV. And then I would align myself with with these stars, really, and, and uh, their charities. Those so that only ones, the- was there any... Was there any monetary compensation for the charity paintings or was it just like you, it was like you were doing it for charity too? Uh, it started out with me doing it for charity. One reason, um, and, and again, you come home, one, everybody tells you when you, when you quit your job, when I first quit the job, I'm like, ah, I kind of feel like God's telling me to quit my job. And, you know, people are like, are you an idiot? You know what I mean? Like, what's wrong with you? So I'm like, well, I can't explain it to you. I just feel, you know, it's a kind of a literal leap of faith. So and that plays into when I did this painting, the first one I did was Kurt Schilling. And again, he was pitching and it was a bloody sock. And up here, we all, it was iconic. Very, very famous it, sports moment. Okay. So you yeah, guys, I know, I know, but yeah. at the same time, he, he was a champion of the ALS foundation. And I knew nothing of the ALS foundation until I, you know, I, I like sports. I like Kurt Schilling. Let me uh, see what this ALS is about. And then you start educating yourself on what ALS is and what ALS does to people. And you're going, Ah, this is awful. I'm happy to help. So I gave the painting away to them. I think they paid me for my materials, which might have been a couple hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. And they raised thousands for this painting. And I got, I remember coming home and my friends going, You're an idiot. And, you know, I'm like, Yeah, but the ALS patients were there. So there, I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but like, or what that disease does to people. But these folks were in a, in a wheelchair, their hands were tied to the, the arms and they're blowing in a tube to get around. I'm happy to give you my money. Yeah. 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 You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like, take it. Absolutely. I can, I'm walking out of there. That's it's perspective. And, and you get this perspective that you're going, a lot of people that need help. And if I can align myself with these athletes or stars or, or you know, and it, it turns into more, uh, uh, as time went on, the stars got bigger, but then I feel like, I'm not wasting my life either. I'm kind of like, I'm doing something to help somebody, legitimately help somebody. Yeah. Now there are times where charities call me and they go, hey, look, we know you have a name in the industry. We think it would help us sell more stuff. Here's what we'll pay you. That's helpful too. I got to pay the bills. I'm the sole provider for my family now. So I have to kind of, it's kind of a half and half. 100%. But I always wanted to give back, really. it's, it's it, And recently uh, my publicist kind of said, hey, and I did the math over the last 10 to 15 years, all your artwork has raised over a million dollars. And I was like, really? Yeah. And I said, don't release that. <laughs> like, I don't, it's not, a, it's not about that, yeah. but it was interesting to, you know, when you align yourself and I didn't, I mean, I just kind of give my little part. I did a painting, but you put it in the hands of people who can do big things with it. Then it's important. Like Steven Tyler or Tom Brady or Mark Wahlberg or any of these guys. That's special. Really. That's a lot yeah. of money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of any last minute, like last ditch things that are off the top of my head. Can I you would have like anything? to say this has been a great interview. I, it, it's, it's been awesome that we were at, get, able to get a hold of you. You, you responded to us. It's very, very cool to us to be able to do this interview on the first time, you know, seeing eye to eye through the screen. Very cool that we're doing yeah. this and we, we appreciate it for sure. Yeah. I mean, anyone else yeah, who comes no, on listen, has I, big I appreciate shoes to you fill. guys taking the time man. it's awesome. And Hey, if you guys want to do, I think I might even mention it to Brian. And if I did, I, I'm looking at the t-shirts down the road. If you want to do something, I don't know, like a giveaway of one of these t-shirts I got here or something, because you'll have to tell me which ones are good, but um, we, we should do that for your listeners or something. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. I'd also, you know, if you ever want to make it out to one of our events, cause we do, yeah, I'd love to these, come up. I mean, yeah, it would be, it'd be sick. I'd love to either get you like in a booth or like, yeah. Even for like a couple hours or whatever, we could display the teas and like have people come through. It'd be awesome. It'd be, I think that'd yeah, be great. The guests would I'm, love I'm it. Up for it. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Well, I I'm appreciate you it. talking to us. This was, like Ken said, this was great. I think 
we started off on a very high note with these interviews, so we got to, like, go find someone cool to talk to for the next one because <laughs> we got nothing lined up. We couldn't if you think, ourselves. if I'm on a high, uh, the bar must be very low if you're saying that about me. <laughs> well, shit, man. I appreciate you. If you're ever in Denver, hit us up. I'd love to meet you. I'd love to sit down, have a beer, have a slice, whatever. Yeah, man, same here. If you guys, I don't know if you're um, – your your conventions come out to the east coast but if they or boss the boss the boston area but if they do you know come by the studio the, the, you know what i mean Absolutely. come by we'll, we'll have some lunch or something like that or coffee and and, and uh, hang out a bit but i'm i'm interested i'd love to come out to one of your shows yeah we'll uh, we'll let you know when they're happening we'll we'll definitely be on the east coast a couple times next year too all right sick brian i appreciate you man have a great day same Thanks. here guys take care thank you so thank much you,